Hey team, I'm Maddie. Welcome to Science Side Up. I am uh, filming from the lake today where I'm enjoying a couple days off um, before school gets started. Um, but this week I interviewed a couple of my friends from the meteorology program who study severe weather. You guys Hi, want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Sure. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matt Flournoy. Uh, I am currently a postdoctoral researcher, and I study severe weather and tornadoes. And then postdoctoral means that I just got my PhD, and now I'm working as a researcher full time. So I just started that a couple of weeks ago, and I'm having a great time so far. And I'm Kenzie Krochak. I also just recently got my PhD in meteorology, um, and I study how people people get severe weather information and then what they do with that information to protect themselves and their families. This is the honorary doctor. Oh, hi, Dr. Diego. <laughs> oh, I was actually going to bring up cats. That's what I was going to bring up because I love, because you guys are from not Oklahoma, right? Like not, Oklahoma. not even a little bit. Matt, like you're from Pennsylvania? I'm fr I went to school in Pennsylvania. I went okay. to Penn State for my undergrad. I'm originally from Massachusetts, so right. even further away. Even further away, yes. I did the, I did the inverse for undergrad. Um, I went from Oklahoma to Massachusetts. Um, you did, actually. That's yeah. funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and then, Kenzie, I know you did your undergrad in, like, Illinois, but are you from Illinois? Iowa. Iowa. Nailed it. Yeah, I'm from Minnesota. I went to Iowa. Iowa State and then um, University of Oklahoma. So basically I like to say I lived close to 35 in Minnesota and then I drove down 35 three hours to Ames, Iowa. And then I drove nine more hours down 35 to Norman, so. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Next up will be Dallas, right? I don't think so. No. No. <laughs> no. Um, uh, I was gonna say one of the things that I think is really funny about grad students in our program is how many of them move here, right? Because most people who end up in our graduate program aren't from Oklahoma, most are coming from, actually most are coming from the coasts. We have a lot of people from both coasts. Yeah, um, we do. That might just have something to do with population density. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they come here and then they immediately adopt a cat. It's, it's almost <laughs> always a cat. It's sometimes a dog, but it's almost well, always a cat. Um, well, it's like after you get through your first you know, semester or two of classes and getting into your research and stuff, you're like, I deserve a kitty. Mm -hmm. So then it's you go get a kitty. That was Diego. That was Diego. That, D Diego was your, I'm far away from home doing grad exactly. school and, then, and I just want someone to be, to greet me when I get home. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. After yeah. our first semester of graduate school, we had a tough class and getting our research and stuff and we got him in mm -hmm. January or February, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was only a few months after we started. Started. Yeah, he's almost five now. Like we got him when he was like this big, and now he's almost five. I'm like, what happened? Uh, and if Mowgli would ever enter the room, then we could show you him too. But fun fact, he looks just like Diego. It's pretty much a mirror image. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> they're brothers in all the blood. So I think having a pet is important. It's one of those things like it keeps you accountable for something. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, a lot of grads. It sounds awful, but a lot of grad students like to say, you know, when I got the cat or the dog, it it reminded me that like I needed to go home and I needed to take care of this other being and I needed to also take care of myself. <laughs> yeah. Having a pet is really spectacular for self-care. These guys like make me, they make me get up. I think about what time I'm going to go to bed because I know they're going to wake me up at seven for breakfast, right? Yes, um, yes, <laughs> totally true. <laughs> um, yeah, these guys are great. These guys are great. Having a pet is a very good idea if you can have one while in grad school and in general for life. Okay, so you guys defended your PhDs like within the same month, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Just about, yeah. Yeah, okay, so how, how was that? From um, our living room, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun, Kenzie went through it first. Okay. And then I went through it a few weeks later. Um, so it was not exactly the experience that we had planned. Um, we had this idea that we would like give this big lecture in this room full of researchers and then have this party afterwards and none of that quite happened um 
but you know, we may do. And I think in some ways it was kind of nice to be at home so that there was maybe a little bit less stress, but it, it was interesting for sure. <laughs> one, of the, one of the cats had a field day with oh, it yeah. during my defense for a little bit, but Kenzie got him under control, thankfully, before anything went too wrong. Yeah, controlling, herding cats was not on my list of things that I thought I would have to do during his defense, but it was. So. He did a great job. Which do you think is easier, herding cats or herding professors? Ooh, that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the day. Yeah. And do I get cat food to lure the cats? <laughs> right. Our little assistant decided to sit down so nicely. Here there we is. go. Oh, that was so good. He's a good boy. Which He's the you... one who uh, made a ruckus during my defense. He now has an honorary PhD given to him by my committee. Literally, Matt got back on for them to announce like you're a doctor and they were like mm -hmm. the first thing they said was well Diego gets an honorary PhD <laughs> so, yes, that's the most important thing right most now. important thing exactly I find that really intriguing that you guys have been married for what like a year and yeah, you're like you know what we should do we should defend just like back to back <laughs> during a pandemic let's do it um is that something that you would like recommend to <laughs> other people certainly not, not recommend and to be fair when we scheduled this there was no global pandemic i mean mm -hmm. we had heard of the coronavirus once or twice on the news but it, it all of a sudden blew up two three months right before we defended so was not aware that that was going to be part of the plan um at first but and even even only a few weeks beforehand because it, it really blew up in about april May, early May, and then we then we shut down for about the four to six week period, and we thought that it, it might be okay by uh, after, after that point, but towards the end of May, it was becoming very, very clear that we were not, especially Kenzie, because she was up first in June, was not going to have an in-person defense, uh, and then after that happened, then um, I, I very quickly realized that I was not as well. Um, thankfully, we have, you know, good Wi-Fi. <laughs> at the house and stuff. We didn't have any technical difficulties and things like that. And I will say one, if, if there is, you know, some green in this, mm -hmm. um, some good, it was nice to see people on the, on the Zoom call that wouldn't have otherwise been able to attend the defense. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of neat. It's, yeah. It's a, cool. it's a nice thing that kind of falls out of this. Like people from all over the country were able to be on our defense because it was video recorded. And, and I mean, it, it, the defense was certainly challenging and something that I wouldn't want to do again. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think, you know, both Matt and I lucked out with really good advisors and really good research groups such that we were prepared and we were always working towards this. It wasn't like two months beforehand, we had to quick write a dissertation. You know, we were always kind of working on it. So it, it didn't feel like we couldn't eat or sleep leading up. That's good. To it, That's really nice. good. Okay, so can you give like maybe a little brief overview of for each of you of like what your dissertation was? So, sure. so go a little more in detail into like what you actually study. Yeah, um, I'll go first. Fine. If you don't mind. Fine. So I study uh, severe thunderstorms, um, specifically a smaller kind of rotating storm called a supercell. And those are the ones that are most responsible for making big, dangerous tornadoes. Uh, so I study uh, those storms from a computer model kind of standpoint. Uh, I see what the computer spits out, and then I look at what the storm is doing, how the air is moving, whether it's moving up really quickly or down really quickly, and how the tornado forms, ultimately to try and better predict tornadoes in a, in a real-time setting so that we can uh, better increase lead time for tornado warnings and better protect people and, and th things like that. And my stuff has more to do with the forecasting aspect. So I looked at, first off, whether or not forecasters could potentially provide more lead time for these severe storms. So instead of just saying, hey, there's going to be a storm in 15 minutes, could we say, you know what, guys, it's 10 a.m. in the morning and we really need to be concerned from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's when you need to be concerned. Or we need to be concerned from midnight to 4 a.m. So you're gonna be sleeping, be prepared for that. So I looked at whether or not forecasters could actually tell people that and be reliable with it. So if we could actually be right <laughs> when we tell people those timeframes. And then I looked at 
whether or not people like emergency managers and broadcast meteorologists would be able to use that information and how they would disseminate that information to other people, how they would tell people, hey guys, this is when we need to be concerned. And then my third part of my dissertation was related to what people would actually do with that information. So would they get it? Would they understand what it means? And would they be able to use it? because I don't want to have forecasters creating this information and spending time making these forecasts if people aren't gonna use it. So it was really kind of a three part process. Very cool. Um, and so Matt, for you is what you're doing now um, as a postdoc, is that related to your PhD work? It is related in uh, to some sense. So it's not the exact same project as I did during my PhD, but uh, it, it is related. It's it's continuing to look at um, computer models and and understand what the severe storms are doing. Another another component of my postdoc that, that I'm excited to get into is looking at measurements that we collected um, during you know out in the field. We actually drove trucks around and launched balloons and collected. Um, some of the first observations of their kind using small weather balloons uh, right up close next to the storm. Uh, so I'm going to analyze those during my postdoc uh, with some with some colleagues and uh, it'll be really interesting to look at those and see how the storm influences that area and, and uh, see how that influences ultimately whether or not the storm produces a tornado. Hey team, editing Maddie here. If you were wondering, uh, what field campaign he's talking about there, it's Taurus, the one I got to go on last summer. Um, and there's a whole video on this channel um, where I recorded from the field. You should totally go check it out. Link is in the description. Yeah, what about you, Kenzie? Is, is what you're doing now related, or is it some, are you doing something brand new? Um, it's really related to what I've been doing. I was a graduate student in the Center for Risk and Crisis Management at OU, and now I'm a research scientist in that same center. Um, so basically what we look at there is not only how people understand weather risks, but risks related to other things like nuclear energy and climate change and things like that. So I'm doing things very similar to what I did in my uh, PhD, but now just focusing a little bit more broadly on severe weather, tropical uh, cyclones and hurricanes, as well as winter weather and other hazards as well. That's awesome. So it kind of just sounds like you went from, so I refer to grad students in science programs as discount scientists. So Correct. You, it really sounds like you just sort of went from discount scientist to real regular scientist. <laughs> yes. yes, do very similar things, just pay more to do it. It was kind of nice. <laughs> that's great, that's great, that's great, yeah. Kenzie is about to talk about her work with the Hazardous Weather Testbed. Um, it's a joint program with the National Weather Service and the National Severe Storms Laboratory that brings together operational and research meteorologists um, so that they can test out new forecasting tools. It's a super cool program, and there's a link in the description to its web webpage if you want to learn more. So one of the... Matt gets to go out into the field and chase storms and do that type of cool stuff. And I do field work as well, but it looks a little bit different. Uh, what we do is we develop these products and we develop this new knowledge, and then we have to go test it with people like forecasters and emergency managers and other people who are going to use this information or create this information. As a matter of fact, that's what forecasters do. Um, and so for five weeks every year, I get to work with a group of, here's a kitty, with a group of really cool scientists okay. who Chester. bring these products into what we call a test bed. Mm -hmm. And so we have forecasters come in and we tell them, okay, this is our new concept. This is what we would like the product to look like. Here's the real weather going on today. Can mm -hmm. you create this product or can you use this knowledge or this new tool to help you with your job? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, as a researcher, I get to go in and be like, this is the coolest thing ever. You're gonna love it, totally promise. And then they try it for a week and they're like, this sucks. This is awful. I can't use this. This will never work. Cause I'm not a forecaster. I don't, I don't have mm -hmm. to follow their schedules and do everything they do in a day. So it's a really humbling experience, but I think it's really important as researchers to remember what our ultimate goal is and to make sure that we're getting those practitioners forecasters and broadcast meteorologists into our process and so they get to have some say in what we're doing. 
yeah, I've always wondered what goes on on like the second floor when the visitor parking is packed for a week. That's <laughs> right. That, yeah. That's it. That's it. And as a grad student, you can come down and sit in that anytime you want. I think it's like, I don't know. It's a really humbling experience, no matter if you're a researcher or just someone sitting there, like getting to hear the chatter. Forecasters mm -hmm. are amazing. And yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we, as researchers, I don't know that we quite know everything that goes on. It's really, no. really neat because it's kind of like the cutting edge of experimental products and things like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm uh, very privileged to be in the weather center normally, not during a <laughs> pandemic, but in a normal May or June during severe weather season, it's, it's really, really cool to just walk in there. I'm not a formal participant or anything, mm -hmm. um, but it's okay to just walk in and, and listen to the discussion and um, just watch what people are doing with the new experimental data sets and stuff. It's like Kenzie said, it's really humbling. That's really cool. And on Chase Day, you can go in Ooh. and you can see what the forecasters are doing and they're using all these experimental models, like ones that, I don't know, some people can see and other people can't. So you get like the inside scoop. Mm -hmm. Where should we go? Tell me. Where Actually, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But during Taurus, uh, Kenzie and I would text sometimes. Well, we text all the time, but we would text sometimes about what she was doing in HWT. And I would be able to relay that information to kind of the organizers of Taurus. And, you know, that obviously can influence the decision at times, what, what the forecasters are, are thinking. So it's, it's really cool collaboration there, too. So, Did you guys do hazardous weather test bed this year? We did. Um, Was it a virtual it, Zoom? We yeah. Had a question. Did you spend the whole time being tech support for people with gray hair let's just go with that possibly <laughs> actually no i was shocked at how well it worked um, okay it pivoted good. very quickly in late march mid-april mm -hmm. um from in person and 80 scientists flying down to virtual and um it worked really well i i i would knock on wood but it's over so we're fine but like Every day, I think we all sat in our final Zoom meeting where we went over the day's activities and we were like, okay, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just a little bit of shock and awe. There were certainly mm -hmm. moments where it was, you know, we dumped a whole like operations plan on our participants and said like, you know, click this button, click this button, click this button and that button. And I have no idea how it went as well as it did, but you know, kudos to the organizers and that mm -hmm. whole team and also kudos to our participants because Part of the really cool thing is coming down here and getting to talk to people and, you know, potentially going chasing and, you know, mm -hmm. eating at cool places in Norman. And so they really got all of the work of filling out all of the evaluations and doing all the forecasting and like none of the fun mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> outside yeah. of the forecasting. Of course. You'll have to double so. down next year on the fun. We will. We will. Well, it'll be interesting to see. I really hope that we can have a big experiment, but you never, again, yeah. I, I have stopped trying to plan for the future. <laughs> That's fair. That's totally fair. I am the worst meteorologist on the planet because if it's happening south of the Arctic Circle, I'm completely oblivious. Like, <laughs> That's okay. My, we yeah. need meteorologists like you, though, because I have no idea what's going on in the Arctic Circle. Yes. <laughs> so, between all of us, we got the bases covered, right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, like, my husband is a lawyer will tell me it's like maddie we've got a storm coming tonight I'm like oh we do oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's like when my mom texts me and is like is this storm near us bad and i was like i don't know i i wasn't watching minnesota today <laughs> let me yeah. look out the window 800 miles away hmm. <laughs> but i i guess i can look yeah i get that about um because liam's family is in south carolina so i get questions of is this hurricane going to be a problem? And so I pretend to know things about hurricanes. Um, I just go to the like National Hurricane Center and like look yeah. at their track forecast. And I'm like, nah, y'all are fine. Um, or oh, maybe go to Savannah. Just spend a weekend in Savannah. It'll be great. <laughs> you know, that's what people want, though. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's like what a a broadcast meteorologist does right they forecast mm -hmm. but they also communicate they give you the mm -hmm. most important information when you need it and how you need it i mm -hmm. i mean no knocks to the national hurricane center they do great things but their website isn't super easy to navigate and mm -hmm. you know as mm -hmm. someone who's not a meteorologist i might be a little overwhelmed trying to figure out like help i live in north carolina what do i do mm -hmm. <laughs> that's actually one of the things i think is really interesting about our field 
um, is the balance between like, okay, we have to do like really good science, but then we also have to be able to do really good science quickly in real time scenarios and get that to human beings who are non-specialists who mm-hmm. need to understand it for their safety. Right? Um, how, how many different science fields have to communicate with hundreds of millions of people every day? Mm-hmm. I mean, the weather impacts everyone. That's part of the reason I got into meteorology. What's it like being a real scientist instead of a discount scientist? Yeah. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty great. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty great. It's my, my gut reaction is, well, it doesn't feel like much has changed. We started working on, you know, slightly different projects and things like that. We're still at home. You know, Kenzie's mm-hmm. still in, in this room. I'm typically in another room. So at least we have, you know, no space for our offices, but it feels nice. It feels really nice to go from discount to, to full scientist. Um, our checks for August just got cut today. So it's nice, nice to see that bump. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the biggest change. Uh, yeah. Weirdly oh, yeah. enough, it's not, it's not like, you know, like we said, it's not like our jobs changed too much. I think it's just a little bit more, um, this happened after I did my general too. I felt like people not necessarily valued my opinion more because they always valued my opinion, but it felt like they trusted my opinion a little bit more, you know, like mm-hmm. somehow or another you like hurdled this fence and now mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. more trustworthy, which is great and really cool. Um, but it also makes me sort of, you know, make sure that I'm doing things right. Make sure that I'm like really confident about what I'm doing because I don't want to necessarily recommend something when I feel the weight of that a little bit more now, I think. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. not like I didn't hold myself accountable for my work beforehand, but there's there's an added sense of responsibility almost because I am, you are employed as graduate students, absolutely. And I tell Mm -hmm. graduate students to treat it like a job. It is a job. Um, But it's like, now it's a job, job. (laughs) I guess right so it, there, there's an added sense of responsibility there and there's no advisor to go back on and be like right. help I screwed up <laughs> that's what I was gonna yeah. say I feel like um the difference is like I can't you you can no longer like oh hi I'm uh McKenzie whoever's grad student now it exactly I'm exactly. doctor yeah. you're not leaning on your advisor's credentials for your like for people to take you seriously now it's like nope you're just exactly you. just yeah. <laughs> exactly and it's a mix of slightly scary but mostly awesome and rewarding that's to get awesome. to that that's point. great it's that's it's it's been really humbling though because the i mean matt and i met our graduate school advisors in 2014 when we came down to norman for an internship mm. and so like we've been working with these people for over six years now and they, yeah. they've seen us go from undergrads to masters to PhD and now to research scientists and postdoctoral scientists and so it, it's like they've literally like been our parents and seen us grow up and yeah uh, they kept us around we're still working with them so that's humbling <laughs> in and of itself but it's they've seen a lot <laughs> yeah when my advisor can't hear I refer to him as science dad that's <laughs> yeah it kind of feels like that right yeah. yeah when Harold would be like I'm gonna it's okay we're we're not gonna have you do that I, I don't like that like he's protecting you like a parent or something and now yeah. it's like go fly good luck yeah <laughs> be free little bird yeah pretty much Did you dump you out of the nest good luck <laughs> wait so Kenzie you're a research scientist that's an, is that not a postdoc position that's like no offense, Matt, that's like a big kid job position. Yes. No, he says that all the time. It's, yeah. it's okay. a permanent position. So unless I like royally screw up. Okay. Then or I like, like <laughs> choose to leave. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. Or that. I suppose I could do that someday too, but yeah. No, we, we love it here. It's, I mean, it basically what I like to say is someone asked me the other day, like, what do you want to be doing in five years? And I was like, this. Yeah. And they're like, what about 10 years? And I was like, I'm still this. I really like what I'm doing. I really love the lab that I'm working in and the people Mm -hmm. I work with and a lot like choosing an advisor. I think when it comes to a job, the subject matter that I'm researching is important, but the people that I'm around and the inspiration that I can draw from all these other brilliant scientists is just as important. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to give that up. You know, the people in Norman, the weather community in Norman and the specific lab I work in, they're, they're really cool people. So I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity. That's that's spectacular. Um, so Matt, how long is your postdoc? Is it like a one year, two year thing? 
Yep, it's one or two years. Okay. So it's temporary. Um, and then after that, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of like Kenzie. I just kind of want to be doing the same sort of thing, except not a temporary position, hopefully a permanent, permanent right. position. The, the postdoc is a, it's an, it's an interesting place to be because it's, I mean, you get paid more, you know, it's a big mm -hmm. kid job, but it's not a big, big kid job like, like what Kenzie has. So it is temporary. And it's, I've heard from, I've heard from people that it's like the time in your life, if you're researcher you just research what you want to you know you can be free you can be set free and do crazy stuff and um, people say some of the craziest funnest research you'll do is during your postdoc I don't know if that's true yet because I'm in it right now but on the other hand you're you're it's it's a temporary state of flux like you're 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 mm -hmm. constantly thinking about well what comes next because I need to figure something out within the year or two because my position is temporary so yeah it's it, it's rewarding, um, but there's a lot of like responsibility. Uh, well, thank you guys so much. Unfortunately, I actually have to run because since I am a grad student um, and don't have a big kid job, I still tutor kids and I've got a tutoring, um, a new student coming up in seven minutes. Um, before we sign off, um, so one of the goals, one of the main goals of my channel is um, to sort of make science more, just more accessible, right? I want to show that scientists are people um, and that even if you don't have yes. the privilege or inclination to do science your whole life, right? Like we do, <laughs> um, you can still like understand it and um, interact with scientists. Um, so kind of with that goal in mind, is there, is there any last things you guys would there? There's a cat meowing. I Diego apologize. Wants, Diego wants to share his thoughts on them. Diego, what do you think? I think, um, <laughs> well, I have an honorary PhD. <laughs> hmm. No, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. And I, especially in weather, I oftentimes find that like the first icebreaker at any social function is like, when did you get into weather? And everyone always answers like, well, I watched Twister at the ripe old Old age of eight months old, or I experienced this tornado at four years old, and I've wanted to be a meteorologist ever since. Some type of gorgeous story like that. And I'm sitting here like, ooh, I thought it was kind of cool when I was like 18 years old and took a class in college. That's what I did. That's not as cool. And that's okay. You know, I'm still here. I'm still a meteorologist. You don't have to have this lifelong passion for science or this lifelong dream of doing it if you find that you really like math you really like science you really like trying to understand the natural world mm -hmm. you can be a scientist regardless of if you've wanted to do it since age two or since age 52 it doesn't matter mm -hmm. yeah kenzie basically said it all i think the only thing i would add is that um people are just generally speaking like meteorologists are, are just passionate you know we love our jobs we we love the weather um, not all of us, but a lot of us are, you know, what you call a weather weenie, you know, just chat with us about the weather. I, whenever I have a conversation, you know, with someone that I don't really know whether it's like the hair cutter or whatever, and they start talking about the weather, I always crack some sort of joke like, oh, be careful, because I'm a, you know, I know a lot about the weather, and then they'll start asking questions, and it's great. Um, well, thank you guys so much, uh, and stay safe, and we'll, uh, We'll hang out at 405 whenever that's safe. <laughs> Someday. At some point. <laughs> Someday. All right, team, that's all I've got for you today. Um, I hope you are well and those that you care about are well. Uh, like, subscribe. Don't forget to be kind and stay safe, everybody. Okay. Bye, team.